I am delighted to introduce Jennifer Durking. Jennifer is a fundraising professional currently raising major gifts for Stanford Medicine. She's an ardent proponent of habitat gardening to feed ecosystems and to save species from extinction. In her spare time, she ethically gathers and shares native plant seeds, gives public talks, and connects people with resources that can help them return their gardens or local public spaces to a landscape that supports wildlife. She currently serves on the board of the Waldorf School of the Peninsula, which her grandsons attend. She is also the Wildflower Ambassador Program Chair for the California Native Plant Society Santa Clara Chapter. Jennifer and her husband Brian live in San Carlos, and together they enjoy hiking, camping, and gardening with native plants, especially when joined by her daughter, her fiance, and their grandsons. So without further ado, Jennifer, welcome. Well, thank you all for inviting me to speak here. Can you all hear me okay? Up in the nosebleeds? Great. Um, anyway, well, I'm just really honored. Uh, Carolyn Dorsch asked if I would come speak about um, the Wildflower Ambassador Program, but also about native plants in general. And I'm going to share a little bit about my own journey with that. But um, anyway, um, so the title here is Bringing Back the Pollinators Community Engagement and the Wildflower Ambassadors. That's a program of the California Native Plant Society. And I'm going to really actually focus probably the first half of my talk on the why and the what, you know, of, of what I'm going to talk about. And then the last part is really about the who, and that's the community aspect of it. So um, anyway, I'm going to launch right in here. Um, have any of you had a situation where you're going along maybe for like 56 years, and all of a sudden you have an epiphany? One, maybe one lecture changes your whole perspective on the way that you're gardening or the way you're doing things. Um, well, that happened for me. Um, this is a picture, of, not of my garden, <laughs> but in Seattle, but this is the kind of garden I loved. I've always loved the English herbaceous borders. I love roses, especially with antique French names. And so I just have a certain, there's a certain romance about that type of gardening. And I, we we're actually preparing to grow that kind of garden here in San Carlos when an interesting thing happened. Um, I saw a lecture that made me realize that the gardens that I was creating were actually bars. Like these, pla these plants will have nectar. It will look like everything's great. You're using your organic. I've never used pesticides or herbicides. You think you're being a good steward of the earth. And I, suddenly I realized, well, this is only part of it. This is all of the um, butterflies and the bees can come for a drink, but they cannot get the food that they need to raise the next generation. So I saw Doug Tallamy. Many of you may have heard of him already. If you haven't, I highly recommend watching his talk about uh, nature's best hope. Um, it's really inspiring. And so it was actually in the darkest part of the pandemic. My husband and I had just started a whole bunch of seedlings of delphiniums and carnations and all the things that we just wanted to put in our front yard and, and fill our vases with. And we heard his talk and we realized that we needed to do something dramatically different. We really needed to feed the ecosystem. So. He gave us a deeper understanding of those key elements of uh, missing in my original garden that I, like I said, I'd created a bar without creating a restaurant for the next generation, the caterpillars that the butterflies um, are, come from. <laughs> and um, I was inspired to learn that even though, um, even though uh, we have a dramatic decline in the insects and the pollinators, we all have the opportunity collectively to bring them back. And so I just found that really um, empowering. Um, but here's a little bit of background, just for those of you who don't know the statistics. I didn't. Um, we have a massive insect decline globally. And they are dropping the, you know, it's not like the stock market where it goes up and it goes down. This is going down. And we have lost, what is the statistic here, 41% in the last decade. Um, and it's continuing to go down because um, across the world, we have, we have changed the way that we garden, you know, from the traditional ways, the native plants that were here. And so we really need to turn this around and look at the causes of the insect decline and then start to reverse it. Um, so here's some of the reasons. Why are they declining? Well, we have land development. And I don't have the exact statistics in front of me, but, you know, massive development on a global scale is covering up the earth that used to be covered in native plants. And we've also, across the globe, introduced different plant species. So we've mostly imported plants into our gardens. 
and many other places, the English love California native plants. We have the biggest biodiversity hotspot on earth here in California. And so other people are growing our poppies and our phacelia and they think they're so romantic the way I look at delphiniums. And so they've all, we've all traded plants and we've all created a global food desert. And so this should be as alarming to everybody as it was to me when I learned it. Um, pesticides, we're using, and I thought Rachel Carson's Silent Spring kind of got everybody on board about not having really toxic chemicals. I would say especially on our food, but on our land and in our bodies, you know? So that's, that's one. And then the herbicides, that kills all the native plants. And it, they've really dropped a lot of herbicides across the entire, the, um, well, all the agricultural areas in the United States, but that's largely what's killing the monarchs is that they don't have milkweed. It's been killed by herbicides. Um, agriculture, you know, there's more and more land going into agricultural development as we hit 8 billion people. And then climate change, we're having these extreme weather events. But, you know, I feel like I can do some things to control the weather, but really what can I do? Um, well, let's look at the plants to start with. Let's look at they serve as the basis of all life on Earth. And we all learned, like, they create oxygen for us to breathe and, and all of that. But I never really thought about, like, they are the converters of the sun's energy into material that can be consumed. And so that creates the whole food chain that we all rely on. And the biggest consumers, did not know this, are caterpillars. The caterpillars are the biggest consumers of plants. What do the caterpillars eat? Well, let's take a look at it. On the left, we have all of those green bars. Those are all the native plants that were here before we all arrived. And on the right are all the little red bars. And of course, it's impossible to read this, but I will, I do have a QR code for the whole slide deck. So, you know, I'll, I'll give that to you all at the end. But we have ivy. Who doesn't have ivy in their yard? <laughs> I still do. You know, agapanthus, acacia, ice plant, all of these imported things that are in the red here are food deserts. And all the things on the left that are the green bars are, are providing food. And, and some of it are even the keystone plants, like the oaks, provide the most. So what do those look like? Well, let's take a look at them. We've got manzanita. There are so many different species of manzanita in all different forms. Trees, shrubs, ground covers. You could literally do a whole garden in manzanita, and it would feed so many different pollinators, so many different food systems. It says here 68 different Lepidoptera. That's the number um, next to the hyperlink. These are all hyperlinked, so if you download the slide deck, you can just click through and look at the different plants yourself. Ceanothus, I call it California lilac here because I, I take a Latin optional approach with native plants. Latin can be a barrier for some people, so I like to take the newbie approach and then we can refine the conversation with Latin. We have our own native sunflowers. We have buckwheat, which isn't the buckwheat green, it's buckwheat that feeds, it's a beautiful plant that feeds all sorts of ecosystems and was actually eaten by the, the Native Americans. We have oak, which is one of the biggest feeders with willow of the entire ecosystem. Plant an oak. If you do one thing to save the planet, plant one oak somewhere. You know, your yard, your neighbor's yard. Um, <laughs> I don't care. Um, we have our own native rose. Like, let's grow native roses. They do beautifully here. Lupin, who doesn't love lupin? I did not know about currants. We have our own native all sorts of types of currants. They're beautiful. They have these beautiful blooms. Mine are blooming right now. The hummingbirds love them. The bees love them. They are a great plant. And they feed, what is it, 122 different Lepidoptera. That's the butterflies and the moths that we need if we want to have baby birds. We need caterpillars. Um, look at this, elderberries. Does anybody here grow elderberries? Raise your hand because I'm just starting to grow them. And I know that they can take off and do crazy things, but I hope that um, I can manage them well. They have beautiful berries. The birds love them. Coffee berry, also beloved by birds and 33 different Lepidoptera. Um, coyote bush, we take it so for granted. The Bacchus, it is ubiquitous here for a reason. It is successful with no intervention from somebody with a brown thumb. Frankly, like me, I kill plants, so um, I don't kill these plants. This fuchsia flower gooseberry, I call it naughty and nice. <laughs> it has the worst thorns, but the hummingbirds love it and it's blooming right now. So that's a great plant. Big leaf maple makes a huge, gorgeous tree if you have space. Feeds, what, 87 Lepidoptera. Sage, cherry, we have our own native cherry, and you can make jam from them. They have a big stone, but um, but better to leave them for the birds. The, if you want to 
have a bird riot in your backyard, grow some of those cherries and um, sambucus. Mountain mahogany, another beautiful plant. The natives use that for their uh, bows and arrows, for the, the wood. Um, evergreen huckleberry, uh, it's a slow grower, but once it gets going, the muffins from those are delicious. Um, native penstemon, that's a beautiful, long blooming purple flowered. Um, it's just gorgeous. I have it in my yard, likes a little sun. We have native strawberries for sun and shade. And so like, there's no excuse not to grow a whole ground cover, suppresses weeds. It's suppressing weeds in my yard. And the grandsons love to go pick the, the berries. Asters, cream bush, sagebrush. I know I'm going to run out of time here. Honeysuckle, goldenrod. Goldenrod is really important for all the pollinators. So in addition to the Lepidoptera, it's feeding 55 different moths and butterflies. And, and you know, you'll, you'll see there's so little, um, you won't even notice somebody eating your plants. You know, if you get it all going right, it's really excellent. Um, and who will be eating your plants? <laughs> the caterpillars. I have fallen in love with them, and that is all Doug Tallamy. He is a dangerous man. If you watch that video, I think you're going to fall in love with the caterpillars too. Um, they are the powerhouses of this ecosystem. They are the ones that are the number one converters of the sun's energy, as I said, into the entire food chain. Um, they eat native plants. They co-evolved with these, and so they don't eat all the plants. They've all specialized on different plants so that the plants get to survive and the lepidoptera get to survive. It's kind of an amazing, amazing system. Um, I don't know how many of you can see the caterpillar in this picture. Have you noticed it yet? That, I had to look that guy up. That is one of the few feeders on poppies and it's called Neoterpes edwardstata. And he's pretending to be a stem. <laughs> it's really hard to, if I hadn't seen the hole in the poppy, I wouldn't have noticed. And it's like, okay, I know I'm anthropomorphizing here, but it's like he's standing on his little tippy toes and he's got his little head into that flower. He's been chomping away. And I just, I felt such a sense of tenderness when I took this picture. This was at the Primrose Pollinator Gardens in Palo Alto. Say that eight times fast. Um, but this is bird food. I mean, if he's well disguised, he probably made it. But you know, um, also Latin, again, Neoterpes edrusata, he should have a proper name. I call him Edward, it seems a little more humane. So anyway, that's, um, but, but again, this is, this is what feeds the whole system. How about the birds? They need the caterpillars. 96% of our terrestrial birds, so I don't know about the shorebirds, I haven't studied them. That's the primary food for their young. They feed them insects, not as nutritious. They feed them worms, way not nutritious. They give them caterpillars, it's like a sausage. It's like a nice, nutritious meal. So what does it take? Six to 9,000 caterpillars to feed one nest of chickadees. This is a small bird, okay? So what does it take to feed a kestrel? What does it feed to feed a baby hummingbird? It's actually less, but it's mostly like your aphids and your spiders. So think about the birds, thinking about the massive bird decline we've had. I can't even picture what three billion birds since 1970. I was born in 64, so this is in my lifetime. We've lost three billion birds. Why? They're starving. Why did my daughter's chickadee nest fail in the yard she lived in in Santa Clara? Because they were starving, because it was an orchard, there were no native plants to feed them. Um, and then it's lawn. You know, we have so much lawn that, and, and imported plants that they're starving. We are starving the planet. So we have these food deserts from the perspective of the wildlife. So how can we collectively reverse this trend? And what I love about Doug Tallamy is he doesn't say you have to give it all up. So you can keep, I kept some lavender, um, you know. But I realized one easy thing to do is just grow a patch of wildflowers. A lot of these Lepidoptera eat wildflower plants. Maybe there aren't like 30 or 50 or 100 like for an oak. But they do eat these plants. And this is a way that we can start to put some of that food back into the food chain. They're really easy to grow. I've grown all different varieties. I will give you one piece of advice. Don't let your husband put his big hand into the bag and throw them, because they will all be very crowded. Um, I made the same mistake myself, hi honey. <laughs> um, but it's an easy mistake to make. Spread them out, and it's just the best thing you can do. Share them with your neighbors, make a butterfly corridor. Um, and you get nectar for the butterflies and for the moths, they need that too and the bees and the hummingbirds. You get hummingbirds with wildflowers. So that's really been a fun bonus. And also from my perspective, it gets people curious 
about what they can do with the other native plants that I mentioned earlier, the shrubs, the trees, the bigger foundation plants, the manzanitas that are evergreen in your garden and make it look really lush. You know, people get inquisitive about that. So, and then the flowers on the left are from one packet. We have these packets of larner seeds, kills of California mix. Those are the flowers in that packet. What do they grow? They grow these caterpillars. I looked it up on calscape.org. And so, and this is just a sampling. And, and I want you to note, I think I find all of these so fascinating, but I want you to note that thing that looks like a seed in the dirt. When I was a child, I dug in the dirt a lot. Maybe you were the same kind of child. Um, I'm getting some nods there. Leave the leaves that cover that dirt and protect that chrysalis. That is a chrysalis. Actually, that was, that's the lesser dart moth chrysalis right there. I know because I actually picked it up, took it home, hatched it, and put it back where I got it. So I would know. Um, but we have to create these, these habitat environments by not being quite so tidy in our gardens, not doing the mow and blow. You know, I sweep the walkways, I leave the leaves. Um, and th this is what they turn into. And I love the moths maybe even more than the butterflies. I'll tell you why. According to Doug Tallamy, a butterfly is just a day-flying, bad-tasting moth. And they fly during the day because they can get away with it. Um, but the moths are tastier and the, the wildlife are more attracted to them. So I'm trying to grow both, especially that guy in the upper right corner. That is a white line sphinx moth. And that picture was taken by um, Marav Von Schock, who's a very famous entomologist over at San Jose State. And I'm sorry, upper right um, is the moth. And it is nectaring on a, I believe, a hummingbird sage, which is another amazing plant. But um, they're so big and fat and juicy. So I love them as the moth, and I love them as bird food because I love the birds too, I, you know. But, and then down in the lower left corner, there's Edward. There's Edward, Neoterpes edwardstata, um, as an adult, again at the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden. If you really want to get to know native plants, get down on your hands and knees. All of the native pollinator garden people will thank you, and you will learn. Um, so anyway, these are just amazing photos. And, um, and it's easy to talk to other people about it when you talk about it from the perspective of, well, you all know the monarchs, and the monarchs eat milkweed. And as we lose milkweed, then we lose the monarchs. And so um, they're an endangered species now. That chart, um, I updated it. So there's a little column at the end that looks optimistic. But the line on the left that shows where they were back in, I think that's the 1997, before that, when I was a child, that line reached all the way up to that milkweed picture. So that line was 10 million when I was a child. This, this chart shows 1.9 million is where it's starting from. So we really need to plant a lot of milkweed and bring them back, in my opinion. And we need to grow native milkweed. So the native milkweed dies back in the fall. It creates, um, it creates great food you know, when it lives, but it's meant to die back. And it's meant to take the, the protozoa OE with it. So the, the disease dies out and the plant dies out, it comes back, the caterpillars have their cycle. That's a natural cycle here. I do show, this is controversial, I'm looking at Frank, don't get out the hook, Frank. I do show showy milkweed in the middle here because it is sometimes grown here. It actually is native to sort of east of Sacramento and not right here where we're standing. But some people grow it and have success with it, and my attitude is it also dies back. So it's one of those ethics gray areas. Some people are native to like this spot. Others are like, well, if it's around this area of California, it's good enough. A ruling, Frank? Showy milkweed? Uh, thumbs up. OK, thank you. Whew, that was close. Um, native bees, you know, since we're talking about pollinators, these plants also, these bees, I had no idea. How can I get to 56 years old and not have any idea that there were 1,600 different types of species of bees in California? It's amazing. Um, you guys have all been through the Master Gardener class, so maybe that's old hat. <laughs> but they're so diverse. Look at them. Many of you are familiar with the bumblebees. There's one buzz pollinating, going in little circles around a poppy. It's releasing the pollen. The honeybees can now come in and gather that pollen, and they can um, nectar on that plant because it's been buzz pollinated now. By the, They can't unlock that themselves. This, oh my goodness, this green bee here, I don't know how many of you might know, um, uh, John Kehoe, he's like a, sort of a famous bee guy locally, captured this Texas uh, sweat bee in the middle. And then the one at the bottom, I have a crush on this bee. Sometimes it's called the teddy bear bee. It's a valley carpenter. It's the male valley carpenter bee. And his wife is actually dark, shiny, 
black, and you'll see her often around the um, different Slossinae, am I saying that right, plants, the different tomatoes and peppers and um, your uh, eggplants, they, are, they specialize on those types. They, they have more general things that they pollinate, but I see them the most on those types of plants. So if you're growing those in your garden, you might want to grow some of the things, the native plants that will attract those bees. And I want to delve into the native bees and their specialization just a little bit more. Um, the bumblebees, as I mentioned, buzz pollinate. They get under there, they somehow do some magic with their wings, they hit a high C note, that releases the pollen onto them, they carry the pollen around. They are one of the most efficient pollinators of things like blueberries, which is the flower below it, which I have in my garden, strategically placed near the manzanita. So they come in for the whole line of products I have lined up for them there. And, and I have a better blueberry crop as a result because they're coming in, there's that biomass that they're attracted to. So those can exist side by side. I love this one, the pre-nose um, leaf cutter bee, um, sorry, squash bee. Um, this one, the, the female actually lives in the ground or in other like rotting wood, other areas like that but the males hang out in the flowers waiting for the females to show up and that's where they sleep. And sometimes I've heard, I have not done this myself, the squashes close up, the bees are resting in there and you can go shake and you hear a little buzz inside. Um, probably not nice to disturb them, but I think this is an adorable bee. And um, anyway, just waiting, waiting for some action. <laughs> um, <laughs> But these are the bees that were here long before us. They were all across the West. They were pollinating all the native squashes. We have something called manroot. They're pollinating all of those native plants. And so if we have native plants in our garden, we're gonna, we're gonna support that bee ecosystem. Okay, my favorite. This, I have a bias here. Okay, besides the, uh, never mind. Um, these leaf cutter bees are awesome. Look at what they're doing. I think traditionally, I think my dad's generation would have called this, quote, damage. This is not damage. This is a plant that is being used. And I'll tell you, I can live without a leaf. I can live without a petal. We will not live without the bees. So I'll tell you, when I get my priorities straight, it's like the bees are really critical. Um, the upper picture was off iNaturalist. It's a western leafcutter bee. I had only just heard of this lower one, the silver-tailed petal cutter bee. This picture was taken in Palo Alto. And um, so if you go on iNaturalist and you look for these bees and you can even set up the map so you can see where they are in your area, they're, they're here, they're among us. But it's, again, the flower on the bottom is a clarkia. That's a native flower. And so that's what they are familiar with and using. I planted a Western red bud. That's a native gorgeous tree. I planted that in my yard. Um, and I went away on vacation. I came back and there were all these little circles, half circles in the leaves. And I was thrilled. It's like they found me. And then I saw them. I got some pictures of them on the flowers. And I'm like, they found it. And I feel like my native garden is being successful now. I've created that successful habitat. And um, so I'm planting more. Like, clearly that worked. I've got a population of them going now. I do not know where they nested, though. I can't find the nests. I'm so curious. I'd love to take pictures. But um, they nested somewhere. Um, and then the hummingbirds, they're also pollinators. As we're talking about pollinators today, um, they get out there and they really are, I, we know we see them on sages and all sorts of plants, but they really are, uh, they co-evolved with the native plants. And when I planted monkey flower above, they found it right away. Epilobium, California fuchsia below, if you do not have this in your garden, get it stat. Because I will tell you, I planted one. That was a mistake. The hummingbird came, I was sitting nearby, it drank from all 12 flowers and it flew over right in my face and it was like, get more. Like, I got the message. It looked me right in the eye like, that is not enough. So I planted, just now we planted four more last week. And they bloom in the fall. And you can drive around and you can see who the native gardeners are, or at least the partial native gardeners, because they just erupt in the fall in beautiful color. And they really stand out at a time when other things aren't blooming. So the hummingbirds say thank you. Also, I want to point out, you're supposed to clean out your hummingbird feeder every three days. Oh, epilobium. Yes, it's ep the bottom one. It's called epilobium, and some people call it California fuchsia. It does not resemble the imported fuchsia, but it is a California fuchsia. Um, so that is, and there is a, 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 all the links at the bottom also. If you get the QR code from me for the slide deck, then all of those are hot links. You can just like go right in. This was also fascinating. As we started delving into this, Doug Tallamy really obviously got us fired up. 
Um, and you know, some people are planting drought tolerant gardens and some people have lawn. But look at how closely the precipitation, that's at the bottom, that's our natural rainfall at the bottom. That's what we get. We get a lot of rain in January. We got a lot of rain February, well, right now. <clears throat> but, but if you look at, if you look at what the drought tolerant, my brother lives in Sydney, Australia, his drought tolerant plants follow his weather pattern, not my weather pattern. And up above that is lawn. And that is not a native, native to anywhere here. I don't know, Frank. <laughs> But look at that water use. This is like literally half of the landscape water, half of the water that we use in California is for landscaping. And the biggest user by far is lawn. So, and, and I know some people love their lawns. I, we never did. <laughs> we were terrible lawn keepers, never wanted to use chemicals or anything. You can just carve out some space around the lawn and you could put in all natives around the lawn if you really feel compelled to have lawn or you can put an oak right in the middle of the lawn, and then, I'm sorry to say, the lawn gradually will go away, but you can put an amazing oak woodland sort of scenario under that. So anyway, that's, those are my strategies for losing the lawn, but I think we have to. We can't have the biggest crop in the United States be lawn, like when people are starving and when the planet is starving. Um, and then the other benefits we started realizing was they have really deep roots. This is an irrigation system. So our oak is actually pumping a lot of water up into the surrounding area. We don't need to irrigate. When we tore out our lawn, we'll get to that, but we, we've let the irrigation go. So we've gone, we've gone like zero. <laughs> but look at this. They need 50 to 75% less irrigation than most non-natives. Some of the smaller trees will pull up 40 to 60 gallons of water to support the upper soil layers every night. That's a lot of water. And by comparison, over, way over here, where is it? There's the native cheatgrass. Well, we'll get to the cheatgrass. It has very shallow roots. And so, you know, that's really, and that's what a lot of our landscape is now. A lot of the grass you see in the hills is, is Italian oak grass, cheatgrass. It's not native. The native grasses would fare much better. Um, I also want to point out, going back to the deep roots, this is erosion control. This is fire resilience. And so um, these are plants that evolved with cycles of fire and have adapted. And those roots are holding a lot of moisture. They're like sponges. If we all had natives in our gardens when there's flooding, the, the ground would hold more of the water and we would have less runoff. Um, and way over here on the right is an invasive weed um, or maybe one of the grasses that's very shallow rooted. And you know, up in the hills, we mow that to try to prevent fire but the fire can still hit those shallow roots that are dry and still take off like a torch. So you want those deep rooted native grasses for erosion control as well. I was shocked the first time I grew lupin. Has anybody here grown lupin? Have you grown it in a pot? Smart, okay, this is clearly an educated crowd. I didn't know you really shouldn't grow in a pot and I did and when I went to transplant my little tiny plant, the roots were as long as my arm. And of course I transplanted it and of course it died. So planted in the ground. <laughs> um, and the other thing that's happening underground is there's a, whole, there's a whole chemistry underground. And so the native plants are all speaking to each other through this root system. They have the mycorrhiza going under the fungus that's naturally occurring underground. Some of the imported plants send off chemicals that actually work against the natives. And so I, I'd say if you're gonna go natives, try to integrate them into an area together so they can support each other. Um, so anyway, that's um, a bit of that. There's a link to that as well. Um, this is our yard um, back in 2020, 21. We heard Doug Tallamy in November. Um, and this is what our yard looked like. It was lawn, two maples planted too close to the house, especially according to our insurance company. And, um, <laughs> and the classic box hedge. And um, over in the corner by the window, there is a, on the left, there is a lavender. So, um, you know, that's also not native, but as it turns out, a very useful plant. So what did we do? It was hard. I gotta tell you, I hate killing plants. I hate killing anything. But we took out the trees. My um, husband and uh, his sister both worked on that. Um, we tore out the box hedge. We actually did that last. We tore out the box hedge during those last storms in <laughs> January. And then I work all day, and so does my husband. We're working all day, and when you're doing a lot of fall and winter gardening, it's kind of dark when you get home. So what do you do? Night gardening, there I am, 
night gardening, we took out the hedge and we put in all sorts of beautiful ribes. Um, and so um, that's been really great. And I mentioned before, just that lawn was feeding nothing. It was serving no purpose. And there's a park nearby. So if the grandkids want to play soccer, we just go to the park with them. Um, we did all this in the front yard. A lot of people do native gardening in the back because they want it to be kind of wild and messy. We want to do it in the front yard because we want other. We want to be a conversation piece, and we have a neighborhood where people are chatty. So here's how it looks now. Okay, we have added a toy on in front of the house, which is okay with our insurance. But I want to point out, it doesn't look like much when you just sit here and look at the overall landscape, right? From we tore out that hedge, we have a little bit of seating area in front, but there are manzanitas in the front that are going to get taller than me, and there are. There's all sorts of plants that are attracting those epilobiums I mentioned, the California fuchsia. Those are attracting the hummingbirds right now. So these are just some of the things we have blooming in our yard. Um, we have clarkia, which is the pink, the blue-eyed grass, which is um, purple. We have um, in the backyard where there's some sun, we have the milkweed. Um, there's a close-up of manzanita on the lower left. Um, there's uh, amazing ribes with those golden pretty golden flowers. I have not tasted the berries yet, but I hear they're very good, but I'm leaving them for the birds because I really want to have like a bird riot when I wake up in the morning. Hope my neighbors like that too. And then again in the lower right corner is the um, Ribe sanguinium. Um, oh God, they've got me now. The red flowered current. <laughs> I was going to say the CNPS people have gotten to me. I'm speaking Latin. Um, anyway, Here's the thing we did though. We did the first year we did all this. We still had a gardener. He came and he was mowing, not mowing, but he was blowing. And I realized we didn't have a lot of work for him. And he let us know he was retiring anyway. He was cutting down on the number of jobs. And we realized, oh, we actually don't need him to do anything. And we realized too, if we left the leaves and acorns that fell from that oak, that's when the biodiversity exploded. The plants were doing a bit here and there, but when we left everything on the ground, it really took off. Um, what did we see? We've got a little skipper on the ribes plant. We've got a, oh my goodness, I don't even know my own butterflies, um, but a common checkered on the left. We have the hummingbird drinking from the epilobium and saying plant more, always. We discovered salamanders in our yard because now there's a lot of cover for them. A monarch even came and visited the lavender. So I'm keeping lavender. <laughs> but also I'll say about the lavender, the finches eat the seeds. The honeybees like the, the nectar. Everybody's using that plant, you know? So I'm like, okay, that stays. The other stuff had to go. But what I could, you know, my one garden is one little patch in San Carlos, and as you can see, it's not very big. So what could I could do to really expand this? I could engage the community. So I hopped on next door. I thought, I'll take this bag of seeds I got at Wegmans. You can also get them from Larners. I'm just going to give some packets away and see what happens. I thought I'd get like 15 or 20 people to take me up on it. Oh my goodness, don't ever say free on next door unless you're really willing to pay <laughs> through the nose. But I wanted to see where, it was an experiment. I want to see where it goes, okay? I want to see how many people take me up on it. Hopped on next door, create a group. Don't jump into the stream with all the other debates about dogs and whatever. Make your own group, run your own group. I've only had to tell two people, like, you know, I'm muting your, what you posted about hardscaping and no natives. But it's been great. You create your own little oasis. It started off small. There's now 428 people in there, and they're all sharing with each other. So it started off kind of small, but I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and inviting people. And so it took almost nothing for me. It took a bag of seeds, some envelopes, a 59-cent stamp, it took about, I timed it, 4.8 minutes to write a little note, personal note with the seeds, mail it out, make sure it's only one packet, or they, it's $4. If you get it wrong with the weight, it comes back, and it's, or they charge the other person $4. It's ridiculous. But I could do that, and it was really fun. I love giving stuff away. It's really fun. I'm actually giving away some seeds at lunchtime, so you guys can all like share the joy. But yeah, so here's the results. Like the community, just with me, by myself, the community, you know, hopped into the next door group. Lots of people were asking questions. Um, easy to grow audience. I posted something on multiple groups. I joined a bunch of them. One is 9,000 people in San Jose in a group just called Gardening. I just posted a cute little story about the nut hatches building a nest. Oh my goodness, what, 4.6 thousand views. And so I think as a, as a group, if the UC Master Gardeners wants to grow their audience or attract people to events, 
this is a really good hyper local you know social media to use and then I always have packets in my pocket. My family thinks I'm crazy, but I'm always, you know, I'm at the grocery store and somebody says something about gardening, well, try these and do them in a pot, give them to your neighbor, whatever, you know, it's like, why not? And I always include an information sheet. So people have resources like these that they can go to and learn more. And that is empowering. People are feeling so sad about the state of the world. And if they can just take something and make it a little bit better or help their grandkids make it a little bit better, they feel really, inspired to take action, but that was just me by myself. So how does that scale? Well, I was so loud. <laughs> California Native Plant Society came to me and said, hey, we see what you're doing. Do you want to do a program with us? And so they're sponsoring seeds and materials now. I was paying for it, frankly, out of, I cut meat out of my diet primarily. I was using my meat money to buy the seeds. It's everybody eats better. The world is better, you know, right? Um, so yeah, you know, but now there's a sponsor. Now there's somebody who's doing it even more broadly and starting up more next door groups and kind of spreading that out and leveraging the power of volunteer base. And they provide a lot of expertise because I'm a newbie. Again, you know, November of 2020 is when I heard Doug talk and everything that I know I've learned since then. Um, so they can like go, oh, you know, don't start the natives right now or whatever. So we're really scaling out. And here's some of the things that we're doing. And again, I think these map well to UC Master Gardeners hosting tables at events and library talks. We actually did, um, at the very bottom is actually the uh, Carolyn Dorsch library talk at the San Carlos library, We're talking about fall planting. And we had the pollinator mix there. It kind of goes well with the gardening um, for vegetables. And just, you know, connecting people, taking field trips ourselves. So you guys are always constantly learning. We're doing the same thing with this group. It's, going to the native nurseries, going to, this is Marshall Cottle, where you actually have the UC Master Gardeners um, place at the top. And so we're learning from Ann Finney down below. If you have not been to the Woodside Native Garden, it is gorgeous. It's just a great place to hang out, take a lunch in the back. Um, and then, you know, if you're growing oaks, I don't know if any of you have seen the California Sister Butterfly here at the bottom on the right, but that is the caterpillar. I did not take that picture on the left. Look at that caterpillar. It's like the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. The head's on the left, in case you're confused. It looks like it's wearing like a Victorian bustle, right? <laughs> it's just beautiful. And I want that more than I want a couple extra oak leaves. I want that in my garden. So um, I haven't seen them yet, but this was over at Hidden Villa, but just up the road. But um, also going and volunteering in gardens. You guys are doing this, I think, already with some of the gardens you're at, but going up to Lake Cunningham early in the morning and learning about the different plants there and working there, and then bringing those ideas and seeds often back to your own garden and you know being able to, to implement that. And I also want to point out, I'm not really a joiner, which is kind of ironic, like leading a group and not being a joiner, but um, there's solitary room too. Like when I'm at Primrose Way, I kind of get into my own little corner and I do some weeding, which I never thought I would love, but there's so much life in the ground where I'm weeding and I'm interacting and the hummingbirds coming by to get to the bladder pod. And like, there's just so much going on that it's very Zen to me. So um, I think some of you might like that even if you're not joiners. And then also going on garden tours. I don't know if you guys go on certain garden tours I only learned about this one when we learned about native plants. It's coming up. I have a little flyer about it if you're curious. But oh my goodness, the stuff people do, and it's all different. You know, you can have a Japanese style native garden. You can have a sort of the English style native garden. You can do a lot of different things with it. So anyway, and at the bottom is um, uh, Elaine Salinger, Salinger up um, in uh, San Mateo, kind of on the Hillsboro border. That's her front yard with the lupins and the poppies together and a nice manzanita in the background. She has, if you do go on this tour, I don't want to play favorites, but I really, really recommend her garden. We're on the tour. Ours will be a short tour of just the front yard because the back is a holy mess. But we'll have ginger snaps and lemonade and maybe some caterpillars. I have a caterpillar guy in the East Bay who's going to bring us pipe vine swallowtail caterpillars. So if they hatch at the right time. So really check that out. And then... Another idea, if you guys are trying to distribute information or seeds or whatever, those little libraries are great. You can just ping somebody and say, hey, I left that at the little library, safe postage. My grandson, Charlie, is, he's kind of my protege. He's the one who's really into all of this. Around Christmas, we took little $5 books about butterflies and about bees, and we strapped some seeds to them in a little envelope with some red ribbon. And we just went to all the neighborhoods, and we just put in these little freebies 
And he felt so empowered. He felt like he was making a difference. And it might just be on the way to school. He'd like, quick, he'd like jump out. He'd be tying him in the car while we're driving, you know, making little bows. And it's like, okay, quick, Charlie, get him in the box. So anyway, that's really, that's really great. So any opportunity to surprise people, like I said, at the grocery store. And then, um, you know, just with this program, just in one year, we've got 25 members. We've distributed over um, 1,100 uh, packets. Um, one of the members who said, I just want to lurk. I don't really want to join. I'm not a joiner. She went off and started a pollinator garden at Kirk Park in San Jose by her, all by her lonesome. And I'm like, wow, like, look at you go. <laughs> I thought you didn't want to join. Um, one went and created signs for a school garden, um, just designed them and put them up. And then we've, we've only done like four field trips. They're kind of sometimes tricky to coordinate, but a couple of nursery visits. And then um, we're doing tabling. If you haven't heard about it, there's a wildflower show coming up through the CNPS, and we'll be on the tour, and we're stuffing more seed packets. We are constantly, I do that while I watch TV, by the way. Like, <laughs> it's like, like knitting. Um, and then we also do some, the, the libraries really want to partner with us, so we're looking into, into that. And then here's some of the feedback. One woman didn't have any room in her garden at all. She just had a pot, and she put the seeds in the pot, and that's what they did. Oddly, it was the hills of California that liked sun. She did some in sun, she did some in shade, and in the sun area, she got all the plants that like sun. In the shade area, she got all the ones. I thought I sent her two packets. I'm like, was that two different packets? But the, what bloomed is what liked the light where it was. So that was a kind of a versatile packet. This is a tidy tips at the bottom in somebody else's garden that she grew. And it's a, just a gorgeous wildflower. One guy I met in Oakland, he's starting a whole landscape business. And he doesn't know anything about natives. And so I gave him a bunch of resources and some free seeds just to kind of like get him going. And so these conversations can really take on a whole life of their own. One woman had just scraped her yard and didn't know what to do with it, and she's going all natives. So that was pretty fun. And then I, I'll just kind of quickly go through this. We do have online resources if people are curious about this style of gardening. Um, there's a forum where you can ask questions. There are 1,300 people on that forum, and that's how many opinions there are. So <laughs> you, know, um, you learn who to listen to and whatever. I cannot recommend Doug Tallamy's talk enough. If you have not heard it, I think it could change your life. So, um, and he does say, again, like if we all go 70% native, keep your roses, keep your asparagus, keep whatever. Like he's not that sort of you have to be all in kind of, kind of attitude. It's like there's gotta be room for all of it. And I'm just really grateful to CNPS for partnering. And then the Wildflower Ambassador Program itself has some resources if people are curious about how we did it or wanna learn how to map that over to yourselves. Um, and then I do have a next, the next door group I mentioned. I have a QR code if you're interested in checking that out. You can just lurk. <laughs> There's not a whole lot to do. And then I love this quote. I know everybody uses this quote, but I just think it is so true that you know when we band together and a, even a small group of us decides to do something, we can really make great change. And um, so that's just a real, I love that quote. And I don't know, I hope I left time for questions. I'm looking at the clock going, where am I at? <laughs> Okay, yeah, of course, but first, um, from Stu, I have an apricot tree that bloomed early. I'm worried because I didn't see any pollinators. I'm afraid the cold and rain kept them out of my area. Normally, I have tons of different pollinators. I'm looking for companion plants that attract uh -huh. mushrooms. Ooh, well, and I would say depending on the time of year, I, okay, this, I'm wading out of my own comfort zone here with like what blooms and what pollinators work with orchards, you know, so, um, my eyes are wandering up to Frank. <laughs> you got to weigh in on the best pollinators. I do know that the, the bumblebees can be generalists. I know that the alfalfa bees are used a lot in, in um, agriculture. Um, I'm not sure which, which ones would be best for an orchard, but I would plant a variety. Of, I'm going to go back to natives. These are the things they co-evolve with. I would plant a variety, and especially the things that are blooming at the time of year that that's blooming. And... I think you get a certain biomass because I see a lot of bee diversity. In fact, I'll share. I was with the gal who runs the Primrose Way Pollinator Gardens, Juanita Salisbury. Some of you may know her. Uh, we were in her backyard packing up seeds. Her backyard is nothing like the gardens, which she has to maintain to please humans. Her backyard is to please the pollinators. And so it's just, it's wild. There's just all these plants. And we're sitting there packaging seeds. And she opens a little champagne toward the end, because that's how she rolls. And, you know, we have a little um, melon there. And these two tiny, pretty, they're called fairy bees, came down. You could only tell they were bees because those little saddlebags, they were females with the pollen sacks. And one landed on the champagne and took a sip, and one landed on the melon. 
And it was like they were partying with us. And I'm like, of course, like the queen bee of the pollinator gardens. She has like seven gardens there now. Of course, they're going to come party with us. So my suggestion would be just plant a lot of native things and then see if you can build the biomass. Just quickly, um, I realized that wildflowers should ideally be planted in the fall, but can they be germinated right now with our current wet weather? So I'm going to quote, so uh, Judith Lowry Larner, uh, Larner Seeds, she says, if you're coastal, you could even plant into April with the wildflowers, uh, depending on your, on your weather. My attitude is experiment. So fall, it's supposed to be like kind of through March is kind of the cutoff you know, where we stop saying plant them. Um, so I would still do it. And, and I think the caveat is if you do it out of season, um, you're kind of getting off that annual s schedule. Like they, they put down deep roots. You see the poppies blooming now, put down their roots in the fall and they've really shot up now. So anyway, but I, I would take, I have some pollinator mix. You can take half now and half later. The big thing is, the, you can do the um, perennials year round. You can just start them in pots any time of the year. Just you know, keep them moist and keep them growing and then you can put them in the ground. And then this is the time of year I like to just go get shrubs and things like that. And even though it's not the ideal time to get them established, you can still get them in the ground really heavily irrigated, so. Thank yeah. you. Um, a couple more, if you all don't mind. Um, this is regarding cabbage moth caterpillars. <laughs> Is it okay to feed them to the chickens? <laughs> well, see, it's still bird food. See, that's, um, it's, it's going up the food chain. So I'm, I have, I'm agnostic about that. I love chickens and I love caterpillars. But I almost, I've almost, I want more caterpillars in my yard so badly. I've thought about planting brassicas just to get the caterpillars on them, not even to eat myself. Um, so I don't know. I do know people too who've grown carrots, attracted the Anna swallowtail. Who cares if they eat your carrot tops, right? So um, I don't know, you know. Give them to the chickens. <laughs> so some natives are invasive, such as California fuchsia. Which others are? Oh, no, that's fine. And actually, and again, I'm going to quote Doug Tell me, by definition, they're not invasive because they were here first. <laughs> so they can be aggressive. And I think, um, like, I know in certain circumstances, like, the evening primrose can take off in some gardens, given the right circumstances. In other gardens, it's well-behaved and very popular with hummingbirds and bumblebees. So um, I know that there are, you could probably Google it up, there are, probably are quite a few that, given the right circumstances, take off. But in my own garden, again, only two years into it, um, I haven't run into any problems. And my attitude is I'm not actually, in the front, I want the humans to like it, but I'm not gardening for humans anymore. Like, I feel like Doug telling me really made me see, like, I need to garden for the pollinators. I need to garden for the Lepidoptera. And, you know, if the humans appreciate it, that's great, too. <laughs> so, um, just so you know, Jennifer is going to spend the day with us. We are really lucky. So if you have any other questions, um, I think you'll have yeah. time as the day goes by. To Absolutely. And yeah. we just want to thank yeah. you yeah. so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And and it, I have seeds. At lunchtime, I have, I have seeds and handouts at lunchtime. So you can come get some stuff. So anyway, thank you.